Hello, everybody, and welcome to Yes Presents Personal Journeys, a conversation with three contributors to the new Personal Journeys issue of Yes Magazine. These are all folks who have taken different paths to making change and will share with us today the lessons that they've learned along the way. Throughout this conversation we'll be having today, I invite our audience members to reflect on your own journey, both where you've been, where you want to go, as we work together to build a more just, equitable, compassionate, and sustainable world. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. I'm the racial justice editor at Yes Media, a nonprofit reader supported publisher of solutions journalism for more than 25 years. Yes is based in the Seattle area, which is the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish and Suquam Suquamish tribes. I invite you all to read our full land acknowledgement on the about page of our website, yesmagazine.org. And now I'd like to introduce our guest panelists today, who if you could please turn on your videos for us, I'll take our audience through who the three of you are, starting with Ruth King, who appears on the front cover of the latest issue of Yes, our personal journeys issue. Ruth is the founder of the Mindful of Race Institute. She's a professionally trained psychologist, organizational development consultant, celebrated author, educator, and meditation teacher. Her latest book is Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism from the Inside Out. Next joining us is Sean Ginwright. He is a leading innovator, provocateur, and thought leader on African-American youth, youth activism, and youth development. He is professor of education in the Africana Studies Department and senior research associate at San Francisco State University. His new book is called The Four Pivots, Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves. And last but not least, Rachel Powell Horn is a climate solutions and soil regeneration research writer. Her work explores how regenerative food systems can heal humans, society, and the natural world. She lives in the Haute Pyrenees in France, where she balances activism with joyfulness and well being. Welcome to the event, um, the three of you, Ruth, Sean, and Rachel. Um, so let me ask, actually start by asking uh, the three of you to unmute yourselves. And Ruth, I would love to start with you. And I, I really go through with all our uh, three panelists to give our audience a sense of your personal journey that you write about in the latest issue of Yes. For those in our audience who haven't yet picked up the issue or haven't had a chance to read it, or it's been a while since they've read it, to remind us of the journey that you take us on in the latest Yes. Thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of this. And what I'm writing about and sharing is a personal journey of emotional maturation. As I moved through a number of, uh, I came to recognize a number of wisdom systems that were operating all around me and through me and through a process of, um, recognition of connecting the dots in my life of um, looking back in order to move forward um, uh, and in a way that is respectful and tender and um, moving through these territories of rage and its righteousness as well as race and racism as um, infrastructures in my system uh, really looking at um, the, the, what I'm writing about as a journey of kind of confronting that in a loving way and gentling myself into a sense of self-compassion, self-respect, -res self-reflection that um, culminates in what I consider to be a way of serving more wisely with a pure intention of harmonizing um, all that I'm um, connecting and touching and influencing. And um, so I'm taking you on a journey with me uh, through um, all of these landfills that, um, and how they served me, how they're not a mistake, but how connecting the dots and recognizing them as wisdom systems have been so powerful. 
Sean Jinwright, uh, turning to you next, uh, can you share with us the journey that you write about in our latest issue? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think the place to start is, you know, most of my career, um, um, I've worn two hats, one as a researcher and professor, and then one um, as a, a practitioner, uh, as an organizer, and working with young people. And I remember probably around uh, 1987, 1988, um, I was uh, completing my doctorate degree at UC Berkeley. I was helping a group of young people organize in Oakland, California around uh, police in their schools. And I was having to raise about a half million dollars a year for the nonprofit organization that I funded, that I founded. And I woke up one night about 3 a.m. and I was sweating. And I went, uh, I went into my kitchen to drink some water. And all of a sudden, a wave of emotion hit me and I fell to my knees and I began sobbing, crying. Um, I forgot to tell you, I also had a one-year-old son that had just been born. And so I had so much enormous pressure on me uh, to finish my dissertation, to raise my son, to um, help these young people organize, to uh, raise money. Uh, my, my wife and spouse came into the living room at pitch back black at night. She heard me and she said, what's wrong? And I couldn't speak. Um, and then I began wailing again. Um, she calmed me down. And as we talked that morning, one of the things that I realized is that I hadn't been taught about the stressors, the challenges, the emotional trauma that comes with justice. And in my piece that I write about, I try to um, reflect on what I call myths about what really matters in our quest for social change. And I hope that these myths encourage us to look at our own interjourney uh, so that we can actually be much more powerful um, as we support uh, efforts to improve our society. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, Rachel, uh, take us on a brief summation of your journey for, uh, that you wrote about for YES. Thanks, Sonali, and thank you, Sean and Ruth. I feel very honored to be here next to you. Um, so the journey that I wrote about was one of taking personal responsibility. Um, I always saw myself uh, as not part of the problem. I was someone that cared, uh, when I'm the problem I'm talking about, the climate crisis here particularly, I was someone that saw myself as having um, a deep love and connection with the earth. I wasn't like one of those others those other polluters, those others that didn't care. And my journey was to really come to a place um, of realizing that I was part of the problem, but by looking that in the mirror and accepting that, I was able to move forward to be part of the solution. And it took that moment of realization of, wow, actually I'm a big part of this problem and I need to really reflect on changing my own lifestyle that allowed me to, to move forward in a positive way and also to inspire other people around me to make positive changes as well. Thanks. So I'm, I'm going to uh, ask all three of you, because those are great summaries of what you've written about, but there's so much more in, in the stories that I want to try to pull out during this hour. Ruth, um, you you know, where your formative years as a child were in South LA, you write about um, your relationship with your mother, seeing the racial violence, the racist violence in Watts in particular um, during the 1960s, and that feeling of helplessness and rage that you felt, and then also the tenderness that you uh, had in yourself as a child, the sensitivity that you had in yourself, those two made for trauma. Right. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can share that a little bit with with our audience, how the combination of the the horror you were seeing play out around you, the, the hatred that you saw manifesting against people who look like you and yourself combined with the deep sensitivity that you had as a child. Yes, thank you. That that was a potent time. And again, there was uh, there was so much emotional um turmoil that uh was not only in the environment but there was a you know a bit of it also in my community in terms of the ripple effect um 
in terms of the struggles and what people do. What I saw a lot of was people who didn't know how to navigate their emotional lives. And so um, that has such a big effect. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the story is um, my um, watching my great grandmother pacing the floor uh, in deep distress because she was unable to comfort the um, stress of her children, her tribe, all of the people in our families and how how horrendous that was for me to witness as a child. And, and the witnessing of that was vacant of a capacity to really console her or to make that better. And just the frying of the heart that can happen when you are uh, traumatized in, in that way so early, you see the suffering and you don't know how to be with it or, or you know, of course, you don't expect a young person to know <laughs> exactly what to do but just the trauma that gets set in and the tenderness that I felt was I always wanted to talk about those things. And yet there, there was a feeling of terror and you became a bit of a target. If you, if you actually talked about tenderness, it was almost dangerous. So I remember being called a crybaby or, you know, asking a lot of questions around why, why, why? And uh, when I look back on that, that's really been a big part of the mantra. The why turned into curiosity that turned into um, a sense of strengthening of the heart um, and providing this crybaby with a space of healing. So because this baby had a lot of growing up to do as well as a lot of um, teaching in the world to do. So, so I, uh, it's, it's the experience early on of being bombarded with, with live streaming trauma uh, at a high pitch level, including the Watts riot, including my father being killed uh, by his girlfriend in a jealous rage when I was 17, including me being pregnant at 16, including me having this um, um, crushed, uh, collapsed, um, suppressed rage that I carried because it was too dangerous to express emotion in this body, in this black body, in this woman body, <laughs> in terms of how you're programmed to just deal with emotions. So, so much going on and so much love in my heart at the same time and how that has to be um, uh, protected somehow until it doesn't have to be. And that's oh. a piece of the work that I've been doing. It's, it's so interesting that, that we, we do see in many of our own journeys and in the three of you, you write about and even just spoke about these moments of epiphany where clarity or the beginning of clarity can come. And Sean, you just, you described falling to the floor and sobbing and, and feeling this weight. Um, and and I'm wondering if you can explore in a little bit more detail one of the things that you, these myths that you write about in your piece for Yes, about that we have to start letting go, these myths about um, how achieving justice is about fighting. But then when we use that kind of language, it's quite draining and sometimes can be not as constructive. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my work, um, again, working with young people, um, and as adults, right? That that uh, that I recognized and realized um, that this even my students at San Francisco State, um, when I asked them, you know, how do you achieve justice? <clears throat> this happened one evening in class, and then I asked them to list it on the chalkboard, or we don't, not the chalkboard. That's old school. That was a dry erase board. But they would use terms like, you know, I fight for equality for the homeless. I fight. Um, um, or I resist police oppression or I deconstruct uh, white supremacy. <clears throat> and when I, when I looked at those terms, I recognized and realized that those terms, while necessary to, cre to create the, the kinds of society we want, they're still insu insufficient. 
Uh, they're not sustainable. They're not nurturing. They don't convert. They don't sort of conjure our imagination as, 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 a, as a human species. And so while we have to fight and while we have to confront and deconstruct and resist, those are necessary to create the kinds of environments and the kinds of places that we want um, our communities to thrive in. But that's only half of the equation. And for me, those terms were, those terms were not sustaining for me. Um, I lost a friend, dear, two dear friends, uh, because we didn't give them the permission to reimagine their own lives. We didn't give them the space to rest. And so in that class that night, I introduced some new terms to my students and say, and I said, um, what would it look like to substitute the term fight for dream? What would it look like to substitute the, the term um, confront with reimagine? What would it look like to substitute the term resist to create? And, and if we use these other terms to dream, imagine, create, we actually are utilizing another arsenal, another set of tools to create the kind of environments we want. And so I encourage, um, in, in the article that I write, I talk about um, some of these myths that fighting more for justice, um, while important, doesn't get us all the way to the end. I, I talk about this understanding that how we think about power as, as, as a sort of collective power is only an external uh, uh, a phenomena that is uh, power comes from when we when we have a mass mobilization or when we have collective um, uh, numbers of people that believe and act in the same way. But power also comes from our own convictions, right? Um, and then lastly, this this myth, um, and it's tough. It's tough, um, Sonali. This last one around us versus them, and us versus them in my way, in my view, in some ways reproduces white supremacy in that it suggests that some human beings are less than others. And I, I don't wanna get into the, the explanation of that, but the us versus them suggests that I have no similarity, have no connection to another human being. And when we do that, we actually begin to dehumanize others. And the hardest work is, for folks that enjoy that that love justice, the hardest work is for us to actually begin to understand what belonging looks like for our work, right? And that's hard, Sonali. That's hard. Well, let's hope we're inspiring others to get through those difficult times um, and those difficult fights and difficult, you know, dreams <laughs> um, by seeing these examples that the three of you are offering. Uh, Rachel, I, I loved your piece. Um, and speaking of epiphanies, again, you started your piece talking about the epiphany that you experienced uh, on a trip that you took that changed your life. And, you know, I've got, gone back and forth in my life about this idea of personal responsibility versus collective action. But I love how beautifully you explain that actually doing or changing one's own actions can have a ripple effect. And I'm wondering if you can take us through that and, and tell us about some of the psychologists that you spoke to about that very real effect of leading by example. Mm, yeah, I think that that's something that I didn't, really think about before is that it doesn't have to be either or it doesn't have to be um in individual change is important or collective change is important we need both of these things at the same time and we need them now um so some of this some of the psychologists that i spoke to about individual change i mean they had some different ideas um some suggested that we shouldn't put too much um, responsibility on the individual because that can be a way to, it's kind of like this idea of the carbon footprint, okay? Like some people have a problem with that because they say, why should I be thinking about my carbon footprint or why should we be um, stigmatizing people about a carbon footprint when an oil company can go ahead and do something that will blow whatever you do completely out of the water. Um, and then I spoke to other people who completely disagreed and said, actually, individual behavior change is the only thing that will signal to people with power that we, we demand change. Um, so I guess 
for me, I've just got to a point now where I think both is really important. Um, like sometimes it's easy to think that we're up against this big system. And whilst it's true that like, the system that we live in right now um, of capitalism isn't really working, in my opinion, that doesn't leave space for nature and for Mother Earth to heal. At the same time, we need to acknowledge that each of us is part of that greater system. Um, so I guess it's a, we need to hold both of those truths at the same time so that we can move forward more positively. And one of the things that I also wanted to pick up on what you were writing about was this conclusion that um, leading by example is more effective than shaming your friends and the people <laughs> around you and that, you know, sort of uh, advising them on what to do can backfire. And many sort of newly mm -hmm. formed activists fall into that crap. I did it when I was in my early 20s. <laughs> mm, it's such a human thing to do and I've done it so many times. Um, but yeah, so basically the psychologist that I spoke to told me that if you don't choose the right time in the right way, speaking to people can have the opposite effect than what you're seeking to do. So say somebody, your uncle has just put a beef burger in front of you. This is not the time to talk about CAFOs, um, about animal feedlots and about how they're terrible for the environment. This is a time to either say, oh, no, thank you. I, I don't actually eat that or just to say thank you what a beautiful meal the time to speak about these issues is not when someone's self-worth can be put under the microscope um, because if you do that then then what you can do is actually lead them to put up a wall and to actually reinforce their ideas of the difference between you and them so then you become the eco-warrior greeny weirdo and they become the ordinary person who's got their head screwed on um, so you need to, so it is really important to talk about um, all kinds of issues when it comes to justice. So important to talk about it, but in the right place and in the right way. Otherwise you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing the justice itself a disservice. Easier said than done, right? <laughs> so we've talked about how our journeys began. Um, what conclusions we came to is, is where I wanna go next um, in Ruth. You write in your piece about the journey that you took. Your epiphany was in a way having a major uh, physical procedure, a medical procedure that, that helped you kind of almost find a rebirth in yourself. And then you found yourself um, attracted to Buddhism and you write about these universal laws of nature that I just thought was so powerful. This idea that things are not personal, not permanent, not perfect. And when, and I'm wondering if you can take our audience through that. I'm like so tempted to just talk about it myself because it's very interesting. But I, of course, it's better if you, if you tell us um, what those. I don't know. I was enjoying are. you talking about it. That's <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> well, um, you know, so so there was this early just kind of. Um, you know, multiple traumas that occurred. Um, I'm, I'm not unlike a lot of people that are probably on this call in terms of, of um, kind of living through, you know, this kind of um, tumult. And um, at the age of 27, I had open heart surgery uh, for a mitral valve prolapse. And in fact, I'd had three major surgeries in my 20s one on the heart chakra, one on throat chakra, one on the root chakra. And I feel like all of these surgeries were um, invocations to return to the body and to be tendered toward the suffering that I had been in denial of carrying up to that point. So the, the open heart surgery kind of in, in, in reflection um, really spoke to um, the beginning of a procedure of opening my heart, of not apologizing for the tenderness that I felt and infusing that tenderness with a sense of, of ripening around what's real for me and true and, and how I impacted others. And um, it was during this time I was, you know, um, going through graduate school. I had, moved from Southern California to uh, Santa Cruz, which is the sea of spiritual materialism, at least back at that time. Uh, and so there were all these things to participate in. And I participated in a dream workshop, which was so powerful because I saw myself sitting on this flower 
and um, there was this torrential rain falling down with a lot of chiseled ice and um, attacking this body sitting on this pow this flower in the middle of this very still lake. And what was interesting about it is that the ice had body parts and uh, arguments and foul smells and all kinds of uh, all forms of attack that you can imagine hitting on this body that was me sitting on this flower. And what was distinct about it is that I was not disturbed by it. And the dream had such potency for me in terms of having a visual image of being with disturbance and heartbreak um, and hatred and all of the and rage, you know, well, was a lot of what was kind of coming down, um, but without being disturbed by it. And the, the, the intimacy of that feeling in that moment, it was so potent. It was real for me. I felt it throughout my body and it propelled me into a search for understanding more and more about, you know, having more curiosity about about doing that. And um, what I later discovered after taking a trip to China, uh, doing some of my work in generational healing there at the Women's World Conference, um, back in the, I think it was the early 90s, um, I met this woman, um, Dr. Marlene Jones Schoonover, who happened, just so happened, we're staring at this very large golden Buddha, and it just so happened that she asked me if I meditated, and I said, nope, and it just so happens that this is a black woman with long dreadlocks. We both had long dreadlocks at the time. Uh, she lived in the Bay Area, she lived in San Francisco, and it just so happens that after, um, you know, this is auspicious galore, right, uh, that I get invited to join her at her meditation center uh, that she was a part of the board of in, at Spirit Rock, and to hear her teacher, and I found uh, the teacher said at that sitting, um, which was so striking to me, and all I saw around the room were these Buddha images sitting on a lotus flower, right? All around the room in this sense of equanimity and ease. And um, what the teaching was that night, which is a teaching of the Buddha, um, is know for yourself. Don't take my word for what's true. Know for yourself. And there was some permission that and transmission that went through me uh, that awoke me to a realization, or maybe it was even a memory, because all these wisdom <laughs> traditions have a similar river that they all run to this ocean, right? But what I realized is, is um, I need a practice where I can know for myself what the truth really is for me in this lived body experience. And I um, realized uh, after practicing and I was then invited to uh, be a teacher in meditation after a 10 year journey of being in a meditation group with uh, Jack Cornfield, Alice Walker, a few other people for 10 years we met once a month studying the Dharma. Some of us became teachers. I moved away. But what I realized was that this practice of stealing yourself, turning your attention inward, ripening a sense of an inner resource that allows you to to self comfort ease and settle so that connection is more possible became a huge fuel for me in um, um, determining how I was going to deal with rage influencing how I was going to deal with race influencing how I was going to teach in the world and what that means is that there was this integration in me of leadership mindfulness meditation and racial awareness that gave birth to the work I'm doing with the Mindful of Race Institute. But just the potency and the purification that can happen in stillness and silence and connecting with the body and the breath, which is connecting with the earth, connecting with air, connecting with nature. I've been long winded, but I'm so glad you asked me that question. <laughs>
So let, let's turn next to, to Sean, um, who in, in your piece, sharing your own wisdom, um, you write about the four pivots, which is of course, I imagine explained in much greater detail in your book. Um, and uh, going back to what you were saying earlier in the panel about the myths that, we've, that you've had to combat to, to sort of push away and to replace with with uh, better approaches, the myth around fighting power or us versus them, et cetera. What are, what are ways in which, or what are the four pivots away from that mindset that you write about in Yes? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, the, these four pivots really come from my mistakes in this work uh, as both a leader and a professor, uh, a husband, a father, um, that I hope give folks um, permission as well as um, some direction and ways to engage in justice work that is more sustainable. Um, I, you know, my, um, I write in the book uh, about an incident, incident that happened um, on my birthday, actually, um, um, about four, four years ago, I went to a restaurant with all my friends. Um, the three of us walked in, we were, you know, we're all like six foot two, three black men. And we walked in and the first thing the owner of the restaurant said is, um, um, you, you know, if you sit down and have a table, you have to spend at least $40. And we thought that was odd. And so we are like, no, we want a table. She said, well, you could sit at the bar. I'm like, and my friend's like, no, we want to sit at the table. So the woman went and got the other owner and they both came out. And the first thing they, uh, the other owner said is, if you don't leave, we're going to call the police. And we were like, what the hell is going on here? And I went into rage. I went into complete, like I lost control. And then as I walked away, something happened. Um, I began to reflect and I get, began to observe myself in that moment. I began to watch my thoughts. And as I began to observe, I began to, to really sit with that moment. And it became a tool for me to begin to use when I see things that send me in rage and send me in um, ways oh, and send me in ways that are not in, that are not healthy for me. So the four pivots really are the first is a pivot from lens to mirror. And a lens is how we see the world. It's an analysis. So my analysis is that was a racist um, owner of a restaurant that didn't want four black men there. That was the lens. But the mirror was man, I feel embarrassed. I feel angry. I feel enraged. Uh, it was the observation of my experience. And most of our, we never learn lens, we never learn mirror work. We mostly learn lens work, the analysis of why structural inequality exists. We understand lens work about all the challenges that we, that we see in our society. But the lens work gives up the mirror work, right? It's like if everybody that's on this call now, you know, you got up this morning, you looked into a mirror, it did not lie to you. The mirror work tells the truth. And once it tells the truth, then you're, you're, you're given permission to deal with and grapple with your own trauma, to deal with your own insecurities. And so mirror work is just as important as lens work. The second pivot is a pivot from transactional relationships to transformative relationships. And that is, you know, we we oftentimes uh, um, we also oftentimes we all have transformative relationships and transformative relationships are the kind of relationships where we allow our humanity to spill out on each other. And oftentimes we don't have um, enough spaces to create the deep bonds that really matter, that allow us to travel through really difficult cha uh, challenges together. So the pivot from transactional relationships to transformative relationships is a second way that we can begin to think about how to cultivate the kind of relationships that matter in our work and in our personal lives. The third pivot is a pivot from problem solving to possibility creating. Sorry about that. From problem, problem uh, solving to possibility creating. And that just means that that oftentimes we, I know I am trained as a sociologist to identify, locate, diagnose, and measure misery. And we actually have to understand the root causes of suffering in our society. 
Yet, on the other hand, we also have to look at possibilities. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes when we are only focused on problem solving, we are not dreaming, we are not imagining, we are not using the other components of our human capacity. And then lastly is a pivot from hustle to flow. And this pivot is a, recognizes that in our capitalist culture that values human beings by what they can earn or produce, sometimes we feel like we're just in constant and persistent frenzy. You know, it's like we're going north and south at the same time and we're not moving anywhere. And that's because our capitalist culture just haven't given us the space for flow. And that flow is to intentionally disrupt and remove ourselves from frenzy. And then it also means that we recognize when we're in frenzy so that we can actually begin to create different kinds of pathways in our lives. And I call them a pivot, Sonali, because a shift and a change is really hard, right? We gotta, we gotta move something, but a pivot, you know, it's like what Rachel said, right? If you do something individually over time, if you make one decision that that takes you in an entirely different direction. And so a pivot is something that we do subtly that over time has a collective impact that ultimately can create the kinds of movements and the kinds of work that is much more sustainable. So that's a great segue into where uh, you are right now, Rachel, in your life. Um, and I'm wondering if you can take us through what happened to you personally after you uh, met the person who you ended up uh, falling in love with and getting married to, which sounds like an amazing love story. Like I think in, within like three days of meeting each other, the, you, the two of you decided to create a life together and but a much simpler life than what you were used to. You have um, given up on on flying as a as a way to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, how much richer is your life right now? How much fuller is it, even if on the surface it might seem simple? Thank you for your question. Um, I guess I would say that, well, my life is much simpler now. I think if past me from like five years ago saw my life now, I may think it was just hideously boring. Um, I used to go to lots of nightclubs and fly for weekends with friends and was very spontaneous and didn't always think about the consequences of my actions. Um, and I considered that um, taking this precious life and living it to the full. Um, and I've had a real shift in the way I live now. So I, I live zero waste or as close to as I can. Um, a very simple, really very simple life. Like I haven't bought new clothes for years. Um, I don't travel far or often. And I'm so much happier, which is a surprise. I was a very anxious person in the past. Um, really struggled to contain and with my emotions and deal with them in a positive way. Um, and I've actually found since I've had a much quieter and simpler life, I've found that I've got more space now for joy um, and for peace. Um, and it, it, it really did come from meeting Florian, uh, who would be probably very embarrassed that I said that. Um, but before I didn't really have um, someone modeling the behavior changes of the life that I'm living now, I didn't even consider it was a possibility to live more respectfully um, for Mother Earth and more respectfully for, for people as well, because social justice and climate justice are, they overlap in so many ways, they can't be separated. Um, and yeah, just having, having met someone, um, a brief digression. So when I met Florian, he'd been hitchhiking for six years and living in a tent. Um, and I'd been living in a city environment and consuming things quite thought, thought, thoughtlessly. And just being able to see someone that lived differently and had made a choice to live differently was just like opened a whole door that I didn't even know existed. Um, so that's why I know and I'm inspired to see, first of all, people can change because I've changed a lot. Um, and also one person can inspire so many people um, because for me, seeing someone modeling behavior that was different made that possibility for me. I didn't even consider it was possible to live like that. Um, Sounds like you went from hustle question. to flow. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> you did the pivot. Um, so we are at 145 right now on the Pacific Coast um, for our West Coast audiences. Um, and it might be a good time to jump into a couple of questions from our audience. And uh, so if other members of the audience have 
questions that they'd like to post in the Q&A, uh, please do go ahead and do so now. But we've had a couple come in and um, let me go to the first one. Alfred uh, H. Curland, one of our audience members shares that one of the biggest challenges he encountered working with teams around civic enfranchisement was encouraging those who had given up on themselves or their authority figures. Alfred asks, and I'm assuming this is, this is for you, Sean, uh, what type of participatory exercises do you recommend that facilitate activating hope and a sense of personal and or social efficacy? That was a, that was a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's important to do a couple of things, um, and it, it, it can be with adults or with young people. Um, the first is like, let's locate some challenges. What are the challenges that young people or adults are facing, collectively facing, right? So, you know, young people may be talking about or experiencing isolation. I know we're back in school. Um, they may be experiencing um, uh, a lack of mental health or ability to talk about their experience in COVID, whatever it is, but, but to have a collective conversation about the challenges that, they're, that they are experiencing. Um, and then the second thing is that once they understand that challenge, it's important for them to begin to use some of the language that I talked about. If they had to imagine a solution or dream about a solution, what would that be? The participatory process doesn't mean that you do participatory problem solving. It means that you also do participatory solutions to the issues that whatever young people or, or adults are facing. And so that process usually involves both identifying an issue, a problem, a challenge that are facing in their neighborhood or school. And then secondly, to, uh, building the framework or building the opportunity for those young people to get together to begin to think about solutions that, that may be a solution to the challenges they're facing. Thank you, Sean. Um, Elizabeth has a question for Rachel. Uh, noting that she has discovered in herself that tiny green changes have raised her own awareness and interest in larger changes she can make. She wonders if you found out, uh, if you found that that uh, is true as well, Rachel, or can you share any other additional thoughts? So are there, have smaller changes led to an interest in larger changes? a good question which I hadn't really considered and yeah so like five years ago I worked in a bar I'm a climate researcher now um and I never really thought about it but of course that's that's come from coming down this path and it maybe started with taking a bus instead of taking a plane or started with deciding to just carry on wearing my jumper with holes in their elbows for another couple of years um and the, but the more that I made these little changes and the, uh, yeah, it's, it's true. I'm sorry, I'm a bit baffled because I hadn't really put it into that context before, but I'm a, I spent eight hours a day researching climate solutions and soil regeneration now. I work for a, a charity in England called the Eden Project, which built a huge botanical garden in an abandoned clay pit. It was completely dead. Uh, and they built this to show that regeneration of the earth is always possible. Um, and I, I cannot believe that I never saw that, but yes. So thank you for the question. Thank you for shining a mirror on my own life. I really appreciate that insight. Um, and actually, I, if, if, if our audience and our panelists don't mind, I want to jump in with a question specifically for Ruth as well, because this had been kind of making me want, uh, our conversations had been making me wonder for you in seeing this transformation that you underwent for yourself in managing the, the, the trauma that you had been experiencing, how did the meditation that you do, the, uh, the Buddhism that you've embraced, how did this transformation, how has it made you uh, effective as a change maker? How has, how has it, you know, not just for your own peace of mind, but, but for the world? Why is the, why is the world better off because Ruth King found her power <laughs> oh i'm happy to talk about that the world is a better place now you know? <laughs> well um yeah so let me just say that part of the journey is coming to a place where you can respect your reflection on your life when you look at your life 
because when you can get yourself still enough to reflect on your life, and this is a privilege, reflection, because a lot of us and so many people in my family are not able to, you know, pause or they don't feel like that's something that they can do. But I did. I, I found my first meditation retreat as the recovery from my open heart surgery because I couldn't, I didn't have the energy, I didn't have the mobility to continue to defend myself in that way. Um, but I want to say that there's been meditation, which has been profound for sure, but there's also been other systems with wisdom systems. I've had uh, years of body work and psychotherapy. I have traveled, which has, which has felt like I've touched the larger body of our humanity because of every place you travel to kind of wakes you up in a different way. I've recognized the connection between the earth and social justice, as you were speaking to, uh, Rachel, I see the planet as a body of color and some of the issues that we face in terms of its exploitation and uh, violation is parallel uh, to that with bodies of color, uh, especially black bodies in the United States. So there's been, uh, there's been a connecting of the dots. My father was a plumber. And one of the stories I tell is this time when he took me to this construction building and showed me the underground piping. So there's a beauty of this building on the outside, but there was this underground system of flow that helped that, that you don't want that backed up, right? So that there was a layout of the plumbing system that had to be respected in order for flow to happen. Uh, you have to slow down to recognize what your piping is for flow to happen. When, when we have Sean talking about pivot, it's in those moments of pivot that are moments of mindfulness, moments of, of returning or, or devoting ourselves to seeing and pausing just long enough, taking that one breath and relaxing with that exhale just long enough to wake up to maybe look from a different lens. So I've, my mother was a jazz pianist, so I had the system of looking at improvisation, magic with hands and the ways that she cooked. I saw her, um, uh, you know, um, be quite the orator in her, in her language and how poetic she was with words. So I think we can look at our lives and see the poetry in it, see the music in it, uh, it requires a bit of a pause. And so mindfulness illuminated not only my reflection on waking up to how all these things were connected, but appreciating this vast humanity that we are and being so deeply moved uh, towards our belonging uh, and the sensitivity that we all are, we're just one big, huge nervous system in a way. And we're really, when we, when we touch into that, we, we put ourselves in check with regularity around not causing harm. I mean, we just become a bit more sensitive toward our responsibility to life. So I think as a leader, as somebody sitting in this seat, as a great grandmother, as somebody that uh, is still holding uh, to a great degree the complexity of my own family life in the corporations that I serve in the communities and leaders that I nurture and mentor. We really want to integrate a sense of respect for our journeys and the power of tenderness being that we are pausing and allowing ourselves to be uh, infused with the truth that we are. My first book was on rage. It was on healing rage. And it's about the power and the use of that energy for good. And that we can recognize that after when we give that pause to it, when we can activate that pivot, when we can recognize that we're all one body on this earth. So I feel deeply responsible for role modeling and living true to that. And, and that includes owning my shit, right? Owning when mm -hmm. I don't get it right, 
apologizing right in the moment, showing my vulnerability, right? Uh, the practice of that is so humanizing and it relaxes the shoulders, opens the heart. And that's the, string, the spring from which a lot of possibility, harmony uh, and jazz can, can be created. Um, so actually I would love to extend that framing to our other two panelists um, and, and piggyback on a question that one of our audience members, uh, Stephanie, asks about being able to offer examples of how to make these internal shifts while still being in the middle of family work and social dynamics that may not want you to change or are too slow to, to shift externally. Um, Sean, I'm wondering if, if you can start and just kind of um, you know, what happens if, if, if you're ready to move forward, but your spouse isn't or your community isn't? Yeah, I think sometimes we, um, we it feels overwhelming to make changes, right? And so I, I like to think of some of these practices, you know, we've all been on a diet or we've all had to work out, right? And we don't expect that we're going to lose those 10 pounds in like, you know, two days. Um, you know, the expectation is if I do a little bit, eat a little less, do a little bit of this more over time, I'll get to that thing I want, right? Um, that health or whatever it is. And I think this is the same thing with some of these practices, right? They're micro practices or micro doses that, that if we do them over time, it contributes to or puts us on the journey that we want to be on in terms of, of, of creating a better quality of life for ourselves and for our communities. My, my friend told me, she said she, kept, she got to a point where she realized that her job wasn't to free the world, but rather to find her freedom in it. And in doing that, she's freeing the world. And I, and I think it's the same thing. It's that, that like, where's my freedom and where is my space? Um, these are just micro doses. It could take five minutes before you go to bed. It could take three more minutes, you know, five minutes in the morning. These are practices that if, you, that if you're consistent, that over time will have a profound impact on the quality of life um, for, for everyone. Uh, Rachel, same question to you uh, in terms of the shifts that, uh, the internal shifts that uh, you might, uh, if you can offer an example of an internal shift while, while you're still in the middle of other pressures, um, you know, it's not easy for, many of us to walk away from something. And, and, and that's actually a question that I've been thinking about is does, the, does embracing this sort of change that makes us happier also something that requires a bit of privilege beforehand? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, absolutely. I'm sitting here in a position of privilege and I acknowledge that completely. You know, I had the capacity to walk away from my job and not everybody has that some people have got jobs they've got children they've got responsibilities they're caring for other family members I was in a position to be able to walk away from that um, and so when I met Florian after three days of knowing him I quit my job and I went and lived in a tent with him in Scotland for three months um, so we were hitchhiking and um, again this privilege there the fact that I was able to do that and feel safe whilst I was doing that um, so yeah, absolutely. First of all, acknowledging privilege. Uh, and the other question was uh, something that really struck me. Someone was asking about, um, if you said about whether you, if you perhaps your spouse perhaps isn't on the same level as you. Um, and is that right? Yeah, so I, I mean, that was my sort of interpretation. I can go back to the original question, uh, which- no, is, that's, I would like, yeah. if that's okay, I'd actually like to answer on that. Yes, please, um, no it, that struck me. Um, your spouse, or maybe you don't have a spouse and that's okay too, um, and maybe you don't want one, but the people in your life don't have to be everything. Uh, no one person can be everything for you, uh, and that's okay. Um, I think that was an important lesson for me. Um, so I share my life with Florian, and he isn't interested in spirituality uh, at all, and I am, and that's a really important component of my um of my practice um so that's okay that's he, we share some other things and I have a spiritual community I have a sangha who I go and meditate with um and I think it's it's okay if some people in your life don't connect with you on everything it's okay to go and 
and find different things in different people in different places. Um, so maybe uh, let's let's look at another question by audience member Nicole Gary, who asks all three panelists, what is different about this current time or space that we are living through now that gives you hope in applying these beautiful teachings? Um, Ruth, I don't know if, if you want to take the start out taking that on, um, what is different about this particular current time and space? And of course, you know, we've had seismic changes in, in our lives over the past two years, and it seems as though every other day there's something, some new, fresh new horror. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, it's tumultuous. <clears throat> um, I've lived 74 years and I'm seeing things a lot worse. <laughs> I think our technology puts a certain immediacy of the issues um, in our faces. And then we're called to, you know, it, it, we just, it's not so easy to turn away. Um, I have a lot of respect for people who need to take care of themselves at times like this. Um, everybody, I think, like the last comment, you know, before everybody's in a different place. So uh, the work is going to be different. How people respond to these times are going to be different. Um, I, what I look at is not so much this time, but the dynamic of dominance and subordination that plays globally. So it's not, you know, we can, we can talk about this time, but if we look at the skeletal shape of it, what we see is the dance of dominance and subordination. And if we look even closer, we can see our role in it. We can see our role in it at the individual level. We can see our role in it at the group level. Uh, um, and I, I'm speaking mostly my work centers around race and racism. Um, we can look at it from the lens of collective group identity. And we can then also see the shapes of this play historically, generationally, at the systems level, at the political level, and especially the ideology and intentionality in this country, uh, and the and how important that has been to things being where they are right now. Um, I think we're at a time where where the fact of us being a global nation is palpable. Um, COVID has been a good, uh, hopefully, teacher for us, and I think what we're called to do right now is to not turn away from the horrors and to do what we can um, with integrity. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, I know these things are not easy. A lot of what we're talking about here is not easy. It's not like you can get the red pill or the green pill in your set. We're talking about practices. Can I be in a practice in my life of paying attention to what's happening, not causing harm, right? And also um, recognize that we are seed cells. Everything we, we're doing is planting a seed that will bloom. So the time we're living in right now is the result of seeds that were planted, seeds of consciousness or ignorance that were planted. They're now blooming. They're blooming in this particular flower, right? So um, if we want to see some different blooms, then we have to concern ourselves with the seeds we're planting. And we're planting seeds even if we're unaware of them. So waking up around that is important, um, getting ourselves still enough so that we can listen deeply as the whole body is an ear, getting yourself to where you can tune into um, the nature of yourself, your, your body as, a, as nature, um, as a force. Uh, and the more we wake up to how we are and who we are, and how we pay attention to the seeds we're planting. Um, that's, that's, these are good things. And of course, joining with other people so that that gets even more amplified. And there are people that are trying to, to there are people that are walking this world that are interested in liberation in this way, that are interested in doing good things. Sometimes the mind can be so tight around what's wrong that we don't see what's also good, which is right there. You know, it's not, we're at a bad time, so it's no good. It's the good and the bad, the bitter, the sweet, the horrors and the joys all live 
uh, oftentimes in the same breath. So can we open the lens, um, not so much from our own self-interest, but from a more galactic view, a more uh, global view to see our connection with each other and the power we have to influence belonging. Um, Shawana, I'm wondering if you can also reflect on that. Anything about this particular time that's that's different um, in what we're living through that gives you hope? You know, uh, Ruth Ruth uh, said it beautifully. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I I think that we should all be thinking about transitioning from an old world to a new one. Um, that. Everyone on this call has experienced some form of challenge because of COVID. And some, many on this call has, have lost people. Many of these people have suffered. And it is in that experience that I also think is, is birthed our possibility. And that possibility is if we're leaving from an old world and into a new one, the question we should all be wrestling with is what am I going to leave behind in the old world? And what am I going to bring with me in the new one? And if we're not wrestling with that question, then we inadvertently will bring old tools, old habits, old ways of thinking, old relationships that are not useful for the creation and the birthing of the new one. So I think what in this moment that we are experiencing um, gives a, opens the possibility uh, for us to actually create the kinds of things we want to see. Uh, because we've all experienced stuff. We've all experienced loss. We've all, ex all experienced, um, you know, ch different types of challenges. And so it is in the, that challenge, right? It is in that, that tension, that uncertainty, that, that something uh, more beautiful can be birthed from that. Um, and if we're not asking that question, though, my concern is we'll, 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 we'll just go back to normal, right? We'll just get it back to normal. But if we are asking that question, then we're going to wrestle with who am I going to be? Who am I going to become? What does it take for me to actually create that new, the new world that I want to see? Uh, well, let's wrap up our conversation, Rachel, with you. Um, if you have thoughts on the same, I mean, I imagine as someone who's researching climate solutions eight hours a day, um, you, you might have some wisdom to share with us about, is there, is there cause for hope <laughs> in these times? Thank you. Um, Ruth and Sean, I feel very touched by both of your sharings. Um, so I, thank you so much. <laughs> um, and yes, there is cause for hope. Um, just talk from like a professional experience. Um, when it comes to at least the climate crisis, we already have all this, the solutions that we could possibly need. We already have the technology and we also already have nature-based solutions, natural sinks, absorbing greenhouse emissions. The problem isn't that we don't have the solutions and the problem isn't that it's too expensive. It would actually be less expensive to solve all the, the climate emergency, which would be good, of course, for social justice as well. It would be cheaper to act than to do nothing. So it's not we, that we don't have the solutions and it's not that we don't have the money. The, the problem is that we're not acting fast enough. Um, we should take heart from the fact that we are moving in the right direction um, of 40 indicators that recently came out in a report called the state of climate action we were moving in the right direction for um, at least 25 of them if not more there was only about nine that we were moving in the wrong direction for the problem was simply that we were moving too slowly so take hope we have the solutions and we have the money and we have the will more people than ever before care about climate change um, the problem is simply the speed the speed that we're moving um, so I have hope but it's hope with a clause that we need to keep pushing for change every day and we need to be having these discussions all the time and we need to be thinking about this all the time uh, but it's not too late um, and I'm wondering if we can just do one more go around with each of the panelists um, telling our audience where they can find out more about your work, any websites, any books you recommend, you know, any sort of parting uh, thoughts of wisdom briefly about here's, you know, here's what I would love to, to leave you with, Ruth. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rachel, for that beautiful um, way of inviting us to hold the, these issues. Um, um, you can find me at ruthking.net. 
it's um, I'm kind of out there. Um, I have the Mindful of Race Institute information on my website. Um, you can also uh, click on the publication play page to get to see the details of my book, Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism. I see it as something that everybody must read, but, but you know, everybody that writes a book feels that way. Um, I, it's important for us to have a framework for how we are holding the issue wrapped in a compassionate intention that we have for ourselves and for the world. So the book is trying to get at that. Um, and I also have the uh, online learning academy, the Mindful of Race online learning academy, which offers a number of self-study online learning opportunities. And the one I would encourage the most is the Brave Space one year deep dive program into our racial conditioning. So it's a program that is uh, 12 months and you sign up for that with from four to seven other people of your choosing. So you form your group and you are guided through a tender inquiry of your racial conditioning, as well as looking and examining what it's like to be in this conversation. So we move through three stages of group development throughout the year and you're guided on how to talk to each other about race um, and your racial conditioning and in a relational communal field. So I strongly encourage you to get a cup of tea and just sit down and really investigate that possibility for a nurturing way to be with this very chronic deep groove pain that we live at the social, political and global level. Thank you, Ruth. Sean, would you like to give out any websites and uh, tell, uh, give, our, give out the title of your book? Yeah, the, the title of the book is um, The Four Pivots, Reimagine, Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves. You can Google it. It's on Amazon, Penguin Books. You can um, encourage you to, to, to buy it. Um, you could also go to flourishagenda.com. Uh, my organization has a healing-centered engagement certification for those who want to learn how to use the four pivots in your work, use them in your, your organization or in your lives. There's a certification that we are that we offer. Um, it's online, it's uh, flourishagenda.com. It'll be in the chat and um, you, could, you could reach us there. And then finally, Rachel, any websites you'd like to recommend? Um, no, not really. Um, I, if anyone would like to get in touch with any questions, they're welcome to use the... Um, the email box on my website, which is rachelhornwriter.com, or you can reach out on Instagram, although I never post anything, which is rph underscore writer. Um, and I just want to just say one last thing, which is that this really helped me when I was feeling very lost in the world. If you're wondering, the world is scary, what should I be doing? Um, Thich Nhat Han is my spiritual teacher and he said, um, if you do one thing and you do it with all your heart, you are doing everything. So mm -hmm. if anybody is feeling like they don't know where to turn, there's so much suffering, just choose something and do it with love. And in that way, you're doing everything. Uh, that's I all. love that. That's a that's a beautiful thing to end on. I want to thank all of our panelists so much, Ruth King, Sean Jinwright, uh, Rachel Powellhorn for joining us today and sharing uh, your personal journeys with us. Thank you so much. And in the meantime, uh, do check out the personal journeys issue. I've been reading it myself, really proud of, of the work that uh, our team put into to making this issue. If you don't already have a copy of this, you can subscribe to get your own at yesmagazine.org slash subscribe. Every day at Yes, we seek to elevate hope, inspiration, and solutions for a better world. And this work and these events are only possible thanks to the generous support of readers like you. Please support our work at yesmagazine.org slash donate. Thank you so much for joining us and hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your day and good night to you, Rachel. I know you're on the other side of the, of the world from us. Thank you all and have a great day and week.